Hello everyone, Dr. Nick Hilverma here with another edition of Things I Didn't Learn in Med School. Today I want to talk about the beginning of intern year, beginning of residency, um, thousands and thousands of medical students who were medical students last year have made that transition, made that leap into their intern year. Into, uh, and for others out there, they've graduated their intern year, gone to the residency, and many others out there have gone from fellowship or from residency to fellowship, and a handful of people that I didn't know personally have gone from fellowship into their attending uh, hood job. And um, I just want to kind of talk about my experiences with these uh, transitions and how I kind of navigated through it and hopefully find it useful and hopefully you can take some of these words and apply them to your own or take uh, some sort of advice and better utilize it for your own needs and hopefully make uh, what will be one of the most stressful years of your life um, a little bit more tolerable. Uh, it's funny, when I was uh, in high school, <clears throat> we had this saying that two-day football practices, which were grueling in the midst of summer, it was hot, you have to wake up early, um, you do your hour, hour and a half practice, two hours, I forget how long it is now. Um, <clears throat> you would take an hour lunch break, hydrate, rest, and then you'd go right back out there and do it again. <clears throat> Um, but, and it was about two weeks long. It wasn't a full two weeks, but it was about, uh, six or seven days the first week and then about five days the second week. And, you know, it was grueling. Um, uh, but my buddy said to me, uh, at the end of it, he's like, you know what? That's the most fun I would never want to have again. So that's kind of how, um, I think about these stressful times, these stressful years and, uh, intern year. It's like, it was the, the most stressed time, um, that I, I would I had fun, but I wouldn't want to do it again. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to get at. But um, I think it's important to try to get some tools that you might not have to help get you through it. Um, and this applies across the board. And I think it might even apply to any new transition that you have. Um, I've said this multiple times about starting your own business. It's it's the most fun that I would never want to have again kind of thing. It's like um, there's parts of it that are really rewarding, but parts of it that are really grueling. Um, from going from medical school to uh, to intern year. Um, I felt like that from going from undergraduate school to medical school. Um, it was, it, it's, it's kind of, if you can reframe it in your mind, then hopefully you can make it more tolerable. Uh, anyways, um, so let's talk about some th new things. Uh, so some things I should, uh, we should do to help, help ourselves. So I think the first and foremost, the most important thing that I find is trying to find a routine. Uh, for me, that always included, um, you know, going to bed at a decent hour, uh, turning off electronics. Uh, I would pop open a book and read at night for the last half an hour of my night. Um, now, these are obviously on the days that you're not on call or you're not, you know, super stressed out. Uh, by, by maintaining this routine, I, I felt like I had control over my own uh, days that I didn't have to be on call. I think that was a really important thing that I needed in my life. Um, and this routine can be different for everyone. Um, I do think it's important to have good sleep hygiene and good, good sleep habits, uh, not taking electronics into the room, not rely, not you know, scrolling Instagram or YouTube or Twitter until the midst of the night and then just falling asleep and waking up. Uh, I think if you read the book by Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep, um, or follow any of the, the newer sleep data, you know, you'll kind of see why it's so important to sleep. And if you haven't read that book, I highly recommend it. Um, I think... Th that was an important routine for me. The other things that I would do, um, I would wake up early, I would drink some water, um, you know, I wouldn't jump into on the internet. Um, it was a little bit different when I was going through intern year. I didn't have as many social media outlets as we do nowadays. So it might be a little bit different for you, but it's just something to think about. Um, you know, whatever it takes for you to try, get in a positive mindset, positive mood to get, get through the day. Um, I have been an avid meditator since... Um, under well, so around med school, about 30 years of med school. Um, I've been doing it, you know, on and off 20 minutes a day, 15 20 minutes a day for uh, several years now. And you know, some weeks I go out without doing it, but I think that meditation practice was something that I, I really explored heavily at that time. And it was just kind of a routine that I knew if I continued to do it would at least help me m mitigate the stress, uh, day in and day out. Um, I, I was a very big head, heavy user of Headspace, uh, the app. Um, I think Calm is another good one. Um, more recently, I've transitioned to something called Othership, which is more breathing techniques um, that can either help start the day, but also have uh, sessions that can help you wind you down at, at the end of the day. Um, Sam Harris has a great app. Uh, 
Waking Up. Um, I think that's another great app. Uh, and, you know, find what's best for you. I think uh, it was a good habit that I had, and it really worked for me. Um, kind of the same ideas of sleep habits and routines and healthy lifestyles. You know, I was I maintained a, as best as I could workout schedule as I could. Um, and this is tough. This is tough for everybody, I think. So what I ended up doing is I got a pull-up bar from my uh, house, or my apartment, and I got a kettlebell, and I had a couple dumbbells. So if nothing else, I knew I could at least bust out 50 kettlebell swings, 100 kettlebell swings, uh, 50 to 100 push-ups, you know, 30 to 50 pull-ups, and at least I did something for the day. Um, and th these were kind of things that helped me. I also chose to live next to a gym uh, about half a mile away, so I was I could easily run to the gym, I could drive to the gym after work and get in a quick workout. So, you know, th this is something that helped me out. Uh, I think it was important for me in, in my sanity and to help me get through a turn year. Um, so I think that's kind of all those things are said. I, I didn't really, I told you what worked for me. I think everyone's a little different. I think the most important thing is, like I kept saying, is find that routine, find what works for you, find what makes you happy, and then kind of continue to do those things. Find time for it, because if you don't find time for it now, you may not time, find time for it later on in your life as well. And uh, I think that's important to keep those things that uh, you do that keep you happy. Um, so let's talk about the actual in-hospital setting. Um, you know, I think we all get a little timid, a little bashful. Some people come off overconfident. Some people come off as um, rude. Uh, it, it can come off as many ways. So I found the best thing that helped me when I was navigating through this my intern year is I was just super, super involved with everyone. Um, I would talk to the nurses. Um, in fact, we would get done with our morning report. I would go and round with the nurses and get their morning report. And you know what it did? is not only did it show that I was taking interest in the care of the, of the patients, um, but what it also did is I got the night, oh, night report, so I didn't have to go hunt down the nurse and ask them for whatever happened overnight. I had it already. Um, you know, this isn't feasible for every single patient, obviously, but uh, over time, what ended up happening, the nurses saw that I was doing it, so what they would do is they would come to me early in the morning when they saw me and said, hey, let's just run the list real fast. So they would run the list with me. So that way, I, I kind of knew what I had to do when I was going in and talking to each patient. And I wasn't talking to the patient and kind of missing the nurse. I had it all ready to go at the beginning of the day. Um, you know, my organizational system to see the patients was to take each face sheet of the patient, fold it in half, write down everything the nurse said on top, make a line, write down everything the patient said next, make a line, then all the order, and then the, whatever the consult said, make a line, and then whatever I need to do for the day for the patient, and make a little checklist. This So I'll oh, run that through again, uh, just cause, in case you missed that. So I'll get a face sheet of the patient, fold it in half, on the back, on top of whatever the nurse said overnight, make a line, then whatever the patient said, make a line, whatever the um, consults uh, said, or any activities overnight, or any imaging report that came back, or any labs, make a line, and then what I needed to do for the, for the patient. So then, when I was ready to round, I told my, you know, uh, attendings like, "Hey, this is this is what we, this is what uh, the nurse had said. This is what the patient said. Uh, this is what uh, came back overnight. And here's my plan. Here's my assessment plan. Uh, it kind of helped me keep me organized. Um, again, this is what worked for me. This might not work for everyone else. I just try to help you uh, get get through. Um, and as I was going through this process and being very involved with everyone, I kind of started noticing like, you know. I was being nice to nurses and even I would offer like, hey, how can I help you out? You know, if, you, if there's a blood draw that needs to be done, let me go take care of that. If you have something else you need to do or, hey, that patient, my patient needs medication. Uh, are you in the middle of something? Let me go help you do something. So let me go take that off your shoulders if you can go get the medication because I can't go get the medication out of the PAX system, uh, PAX system, but I know you can. So it was kind of a push-pull on those kind of things. And then even better was, you know, a lot of these nurses – uh, they do a lot of these things and that we don't get a lot of hands on as medical students sometimes. So when we we're putting in tubes or catheters or um, NG tubes um, or just seeing other procedures, like they knew how to do it. They've seen thousands and thousands and thousands and maybe they haven't performed them, but they can kind of watch over your shoulder and help guide you. Uh, of course, you're going to have an attending there and you're going to have um, senior residents there. But, you know, when they're there, it was a great tool to kind of learn how the hospital system worked from from that angle. 
Um, so I didn't only do this with the nurses. Uh, I went to the pharmacy uh, rounds. I would sit in with the pharmacist um, whenever they were on the floor. Instead of like calling them, I would try to find them on the floor when they were rounding. And I would sit there and talk to them about our patients and kind of run the list with them. Um, I think there's so much more personability when you can go and sit with somebody and talk with them and kind of, hey, how can I help you? Like, you know, this is what I look like. So it's not just a face. Um, I think it's important. And that's kind of how I, I handled it. Um, the same I did with the unit uh, clerks. Uh, I would go up to them. I would introduce myself. I'd say, hey, you know what? I'm new here. Um, do you mind helping me out with this? Or I don't know how to fax. Or I don't know who, how to page. Or I've never met this doctor. Um, you know, the first few times you do that, you know, they're going to be like, you know, why is this person so needy? What, what, what the, but, um, you know, I was doing it in a sincere way. It's like, because I was new and I didn't know. But as things went forward, what ended up happening is I was finding myself an ability to help them more. And, you know, I, I don't have specific examples, but um, I do know that a few of the unit clerks and I got along very well that they started inviting me out after work to get drinks with them and stuff. Um, so, you know, again, this is what worked for me. <clears throat> um, I think just being nice and going above and beyond and seeing how you could be helpful, not just to the patients but to to the hospital staff that's working there because if you really want to look at it it's a team effort there's every piece of this puzzle does matter for our patients and our for our patients care um you know i i did this with the security guards in the hospital <laughs> i remember uh the the chefs and the cooks at our hospital we talked to them all the time and came really close and buddy buddies with them and i remember having a lot of laughs with them you know um and you start to get to know people this way and uh you know it was beneficial because there's times that I was so busy, I wasn't able to run down and get lunch. Um, and the cooks knew exactly what I would eat. So I wouldn't have to ask my friend, like, hey, be specific. He's like, hey, uh, you know, Verma's upstairs and this is what he wants. But like, he was like, oh, yeah, you know, we'll get him hooked up. We know what he likes. So he would be able to make the same wrap or the sandwich that I tend to eat because I'm a very simple person. I like to eat the same thing over and over again. Uh, they would make my wrap for me and then hand it to my friend that, who would pay for it and it was, it was good. Um, you know, we did this with the janitorial staff. We did this with the social workers. Um, I can, you don't know how many times I would sit there with the social workers in their office and talk about when our patients and what I could do to help mitigate and who I could call. Um, you know, what appointments I could help set up for them before they, they got out of there. Um, and again, I know not everyone has the time to do this, but you do have time to do some of this. And I think that's what's important. And this this made my life easy. Um, you know, maybe it came off as desperate. And I was trying to impress these people. But ultimately, I, I really just wanted to help. And I know the hospital is a stressful situation. So I was trying to help them get some work off their shoulders. And ultimately, it made it more pleasant to show up to work. When people are there and they're excited to see you and they want to work with you, it makes the whole entire experience better. Um, and it was a sincere effort. I really wanted to help them out. I, I wanted to make the place better and more collegial, collegial and help people grow. Um, and I guess, you know, that's the overarching thing of my entire process here and how I keep harping that week after week and, you know, maybe hopefully for the year after year, but uh, that's the way I view it. And I think it was, it's important to have those things. <clears throat> Um, so again, uh, it's, it goes outside just your simple program. Uh, you know, we became friends with, when I went to residency, we became good friends with internal medicine residents and, uh, the pharmacy residents and, uh, the orthopedic surgeons in the hospital. Um, you know, you, you become close to these people and you should because you're expected to work with them for one, two, three, four, and then maybe longer, uh, many years to come. So, uh, it's important to have those good relations. Uh, and to put some personality behind the people that you're talking to every day. Um, so anyways, uh, you know, if you're a little bit on the shy side, that's okay. I still think that there's ways to do this and you just have to find a way for this to kind of work for you. Um, <clears throat> so really that's, that's a big thing I wanted to say, talk about in the hospital. Um, I, you know, it, it's always unfortunate because you hear this year after years when the staff is starting to badmouth the resident and, you know, maybe staff was badmouthing me and they, maybe they didn't like me as much as I think they did. Um, I mean, there's definitely people that didn't like me, um, but it at least made my day go by smoother and faster if I could get in there and uh, have a better relationship with the people in there. Um, 
So I think that's, you know, the main point I want to say about, you know, the staff at the hospital. But I think the other thing is, you know, your other co-residents and uh, um, your co-interns, I think the important thing there is to, uh, you know, be a team player. It kind of goes without saying, but I think I I would say it happens so often in every residency program that there's one to three to five, you know, depending size of residency, people that just aren't team players. Uh, they refuse to take on their own work, but they would also um, dump work on others. And I think dumping work on others is one of the worst things you can do because then you're turned off by that person. And then showing up late for rounds, showing up like sleeping in, missing your call, not answering your pager, all these things are kind of annoying as a collective. And it's like, you know, it's not fair for me to take on the work of other people. Um, and when you start missing days and when you start not answering your pages and when you show up late, these things add up over time. And, uh, you know, you, you want to be friends with these people. Um, you know, you're, you're forced to work with them. They don't necessarily have to be your best friend, but you're going to have to work with them for a year, uh, if, if not longer. So it's in your best interest to try to find a way to get a working relationship. And I think the best way is just to be a team player. Um, I, I have an example of uh, my intern year... Um, we we have a cap limit on how many patients we're supposed to see in a day. Um, you know, I don't know what that number is off the top of my head, but uh, what happened was our co-intern, um, her father got very very sick, um, and it was in the middle of the year, and uh, it was kind of a busy time of the year. I think it was around flu season, and what happened? Um, she just like just did not look in it. So me and uh, my other co-intern, we got in the elevator at the same time as her, and for whatever reason, we got separated from the rest of the group, and you could just tell she was, and then she just kind of broke down in tears and told us, and we just kind of looked at each other and said, you go home. We will take your list. We will figure this out. Um, we definitely shouldn't have because we took on more patients than we were supposed to. Um, but you know what? We, we just did it. You know, you don't, in those situations, you don't complain. You just do the work because she desperately could not be there that day. And even if she was, you know, she couldn't be there fully present for her patients. She couldn't even be fully present for herself. So, you know, it was one of those situations. Just take on things that are bigger than yourselves and learn how to adapt with it. Um, today I heard a great quote is, um, a great motivational speak from the Duke basketball coach. Sorry, I don't know the name off the top of my head, but she was giving a little pep talk. She's like, you know, we don't learn how to, you know, nothing's ever easy. It's never the next step. Things get easier, things get easier. But what it really is, is we just learn how to tolerate hard things better. And when you start to learn to take on responsibilities that are bigger than yourself, you start to learn to tolerate harder things better. And I think when you can do that, it opens up the opportunity and doors of opportunity for you significantly over time. Um, and it always happens like this. It, it never gets better. I think that's the most important thing. Like even now I'm, I'm wearing so many hats and I'm doing so much, but I can feel it that it, it wears on me, but I'm thinking in a few weeks from now, you know, this will be easy. A year from now, I'm going to be like, wow, I, I thought I was stressed then. Um, but these are good things. You know, you learn how to tolerate these, these stressful things a little bit better um so that's, that's a little bit about taking on uh roles and the relationship with your co-intern and co-residents you hope that as your residents get higher in uh, seniority that they take on bigger roles and they let you do less so for example um by my pgy3 year i was able to know generally what's going on on the floor when i was the floor chief and um i would have my own patients but i would still also know what's going on the pgy2 patients um you know, I, I didn't know everything, and I wasn't following every single order of things, but I knew generally what's going on. And if someone needed a question, they could come to me and I could help them out. Um, and I wasn't uh, trying to purposely jump work on my uh, co residents at that time or my junior residents. Um, we were splitting time, and you know, if they needed the help, you go and do the help. And again, this is not like everyone's perfect. The days that you get stressed out, days that you maybe didn't show up fully as you should have, but um, and I'm probably guilty of that myself. And a few times do come come to mind, but you know the general uh, attitude towards it should remain the same. Is that's kind of how I approach it. And I recommend you approaching it too. 
Um, and this, this comes to another point. Uh, um, you know, relations and your co-interns and co-residents. Um, a lot of people, or even, they don't have to be your co, they could be, you know, a resident in the hospital or even nursing staff or, you know, x-ray or whoever, it doesn't matter. Um, getting involved relationship-wise with someone in the hospital can be a very, very slippery slope. Um, sure, we all hear these very good, cool success stories, but i probably pretty sure, certain, uh, 99% that it is more troublesome than not. Um, one side of the relationship is going to take a lot of offense to what happened and what's going on um, if it doesn't work out. And it can make for a miserable year for multiple people, not only for that person or for yourself, but directly the people that you're working around. So if you're to do it, uh, the cautionary tale tales out there. Um, this has actually happened to me, not to belabor a point, but um, it, yeah, I'm not going to talk about it right now. Uh, definitely, uh, it, it was a situation. But um, because of that situation, because that situation became very hard uh, for me personally, um, it was a good time for me to kind of sit back and uh, look back at life and kind of get back into my routines. And I know I kind of started with it. I'm not quite ending, but I want to come circle back to that. That I started, you know, doing some things that were outside of my ordinary. Um, I, well, first, I just say I, I got very anxious and very, um, you know, depressed, and I didn't want to be at work when she, when she was there, and it was kind of a whole whole thing. And what I ended up doing was like just really took control of my own mental health. Um, at first, I was trying to maybe uh, self medicate and. Uh, you know, binge drinking on the weekends and that would mess up my sleep schedule during the week and I couldn't sleep. And um, so I, I'm like, you know, I need to do something now. So I pretty much, I quit drinking for about uh, three months. Um, I started yoga. Um, I started meditation heavy and I started talking to a therapist. Um, and with all these things that kind of slowly over time, things got better. It got me not only in a better place mentally for myself, but for my patients and for my bigger picture and for everything. Um, you know, definitely not happy at that time, but I think it was one of those things that you needed to go through. So I think uh, using yoga and meditation as part of your routine and for those of you that are going through a harder transition, like I was, um, you know, it might be worth your time to talk to a therapist or a counselor and get you through that, that information. Um, or get you through that, that situation. Because, you know, if you don't deal with it when you're at the beginning, life just gets more stressful and more busy down the road. And if you don't get the tools in place to deal with it then, then in the long term, you might never have the time to deal with it. And they can come uh, full circle and blow up in your face and cause some massive, massive issues, you know. Um, you know, doctor suicide is one of the, amongst the highest in the United States. Um, you know, we never we don't want that. We don't want to lose our colleagues. Um, so I I, he, I want you to, to really take that to heart. And you know, if you're going through a hard time, it's okay to ask for help. Um, it's okay to go through these uh, these hard times as well. But you know, you need to know your limitations. Um, and you know, at the same time, I learned to say no. I learned to say no a lot. They were a lot of my uh, co interns were going out to drinks, or they're going out to uh, a party, or um, maybe a, a show or a play. And I'm like, you know, I'm just gonna say no because I was not in that state of mind or that place to go do those kind of things, and it wouldn't have been beneficial for me to be around them. Um, you know. I was able to get over all this and I was able to hang out with them towards the end of the year and it made, you know, the last few months there very pleasant and very uh, joyful and, you know, all that good stuff. But uh, I, I had to find friends outside of, not only outside of the hospital, but outside of medicine in general. So I have a group of really close friends from medical school that I talk to just about every day. Uh, we have a group chat and we talk every day and it's good because we can kind of bounce ideas off each other, complain to each other, and then we're not taking these complaints to work to our co other colleagues. And we kind of get at one another. We've been around each other for, you know, all these years and we're really, we're really close. So I'm, I'm closer with them than I am with a lot of my other friends uh, growing up. Um, but 
at the same point is like I said, you still need friends that are outside of medicine. So I have a lot of friends who are uh, from high school that I still talk to just about every week. And that really got me through things. So it was easy to talk to them. I could go visit them when I wanted to. Uh, it was good to have these other friends outside of medicine that I could talk to about other things. So, uh, you know, I like to play sports. I like to talk about sports. So they were a good group of friends to talk about that kind of stuff. Uh, but directly in residency, my uh, intern year, you know, I found a group of friends that are outside of medicine, playing basketball with them or uh, yoga or, um, you know, I just found a, a group of friends and they were, that got me away from that, that feeling that I needed to be around the interns and my, my program the whole time. And even in residency, um, I had a good group of residency friends and we hung out a lot, but I also played flag football uh, every weekend, rain or shine uh, on Saturdays, played in the snow a few times, played in sleet. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. And this group of guy friends became really close friends of mine that I could, you know, hang out with outside of medicine. And it was, it's just such a breath of fresh air to have those kind of friends uh, around. And I would still hang out with my residency friends. I would hang out with uh, people from my hospital. So it's not uh, if or, it's, you know, and. It's, and sometimes we bring all these circles together and we have a good time. So just, you know, it's important to have those uh, outside friends. Um, let's just go through my list here. Um, I think another important thing is, uh, you know, I was, I was a much more avid reader back then than I am now. I think we, we lose uh, the touch of how much we like to read or how much we should be reading. Um, and especially in medicine because you can get very jaded and very uh, heartbroken about what kind of some things that go on. So um, I started reading a lot of books by doctors about their experiences and that kind of got me through a lot of things or about medical cases and that kind of stuff. Um, a couple that I recommend, I'm looking over at the list right now, is Intern and Doctored by Sandeep uh, Jawahar. Um, those are good books. He, he talks about his experiences and his connection with patients and how, how he kind of navigated it. Um, I think uh, when, when Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kalanalthi was one of the most phenomenal books I've ever read in my life. Um, I, read it, I have read it just about every year since Intern Year. Um, it, it takes me about a weekend to read. It makes me cry every single time. Um, it's one of the most powerful movie books that I've ever read, and I highly recommend that one. Um, the books by Atul uh, Gwande, uh, Being Mortal, Better, and Complications. Uh, I think all three of those are good books. Again, it talks about, it kind of navigates you through the healthcare system and kind of what's going on. And Being Mortal really gets down to the morality and what do patients want? What are we doing? What, what's the good that we're trying to put out in the world? Um, Another book, uh, Brain on Fire by Susanna Callahan. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Callahan. Callahan. Uh, she, um, not a physician, but she was a, um, went through this mental breakdown. I'll just say that because I don't want to give you a, a rune or the book. And it's a phenomenal book, especially if you've lived in New York City. And um, you should definitely pick that one up and read it. Um, you know, those are some books that I really enjoyed and got me through. I know my colleagues, they really were into the Harry Potter books. Um, that got them through. Um, and I think it's it's all up to you. I think reading is such an important thing. And I'm not saying you have to read a novel a, a day or a book a day. It's just like, just pick up the book, read five, six pages, put the book down. If you don't like the book, throw it out. I do that all the time. I will literally pick up a book and read five, six pages, and I'll even buy it. I'll spend 20 or 30 bucks on a book, and I'll excited i'll read like the first few chapters i'm like this is boring and i just put it aside i just you know you don't have to be locked into a book that you buy uh i think kindle's great for this because of that but um you know reading something outside of medicine um it can even be related to medicine at least but just reading these kind of things it does help a lot um i talked about saying no to things um saying no to fam or you know weddings and saying no to things that just don't fit your social mental cal calendar but on the ultimate uh, other side of the coin is, you know, you should also learn to say yes. You never know what opportunity is going to be uh, behind that yes. And, um, you know, in residency, I got an opportunity to go work um, at a sports medicine fellowship. And the doors that that opened up with the people that I met from that uh, has been paying itself back ever since just saying yes to that one opportunity. Um, giving a speech or, you know, putting your name on a paper um, has not only 
put me in front of the podium, but I've won a research award. So you never know when this that's no, when that yes be, means meaningful and those opportunities that brings. But again, it fit my calendar at those times. So that was what was so important. Um, let me see what else I got here. Um, I think the last few points I do want to say um, is, you know, things will go wrong. In the nature of medicine, how many people we're treating, uh, you know, sometimes on the, the flirting with, you know, the most serious health conditions, um, all the way to, to death. Like, these things are going to happen. They're expected to happen. This is how medicine works. Um, we've taken a great amount of responsibility in ourselves to be compassionate, not only for our patients and the family members, but with ourselves, and try to understand how we can help the the patients and help the future generations. Um, you know, that's that's why it's it's important to rep, step back and kind of learn more about yourself. Um, you know, not in the literal spiritual sense, but you know, these meditations, yoga, uh, reading um, books like Being Mortal and When Breath Becomes Air. That's when these things come important, and you can take a step back and look at why you're doing any of this in the first place. Um, it's a heavy hat that we carry. Um, things go wrong, and we know they go wrong. And I don't have a good answer or solution of what to do when these things go wrong because I still feel it. Um, whenever even the slightest thing doesn't go my way or how I anticipate to go, I will sit here and self-analyze. I will open up books. I will talk, text my friends. I will watch videos. I will hunt down some sort of answer to get me some and I'm still not satisfied to even find the find the answer. <clears throat> um you know maybe some people aren't like this um and I'm not saying that I'm better because I do this but this is just how I navigate through the world. Um and this is how I I remind myself that things do go wrong. No matter how good you are, no matter how many times you've done that procedure or done that thing things can always go wrong so you always need to be learning you always need to be you know keeping your ego in check and making sure that you're doing the right things by keeping up to date with your uh, certifications that are necessary and your skill set and continuously learning so we can help people and the absolute final thing i want to say is if you are going through your year residency uh, fellowship is you know call your parents call your family spend some time and talk to them um, they miss you. They know what you're going through and they're proud of you, but they don't want to bother you because they know how busy you are. So find the time to give them a call. It can be a five minute call. It can be a text message. Um, that was probably one of the biggest things that got me through intern year was, you know, my family was a few hours away, um, about three and a half, four hours away. So if anything ever went bad, they could come up for the weekend or I could go down. But uh, just having them so close was was important. Um, I was able to see my brother twice during my weeks off, um, my five days off, whenever. So during intern year, and that was great. Um, I missed out on a lot of weddings. I missed out on a lot of birthday parties. I missed out on a lot of football games. Um, so ha being able to have my family there was was very important. So, um, anyways, uh, I hope you guys find this uh, useful and you find it interesting. If you made it this long, why don't you guys drop me some comments and tips that what you think to guide you through intern and residency, um, or even your transitions into fellowship or after that. So uh, please share it with your friends, family, uh, whoever might find this useful, and uh, we'll talk to you guys soon.